Um, I'm going to open tonight by asking you to do a favor for me. It's a two-part favor, and that is, while I am on stage telling jokes, don't be David, be Billy. You don't know what that means, so I'll explain. A couple months ago, I got hired to perform at a corporate event. Uh, I think it was an IT group, nerds, they like to be called. And when they hired me, they said, we have 300 employees, and they're all excited to have you come tell jokes. And I said, that sounds great. Well, what they meant was, they have 300 employees, 299 liked comedy, but there was one Karen. Yeah. And what happened was, she went to my YouTube channel, found a video she didn't like, contacted David in Human Resources, and one week before the gig, David called and fired me. Oh. Yeah, he said, oh, we understand you have sexist material on your YouTube page, you tell sexist jokes. I said, all right, uh, maybe, but uh, can you tell me what joke you find inappropriate? Buckle up, everyone, here's sexism coming at you right now. This is the joke that got me fired. I live in the Midwest, and because of that, I do not pay attention to weather reports during winter because they always get the projections wrong. I gave up on them. And I remember when it happened. It was one January where I was watching, where I was watching, and they said, oh, we got a blizzard coming. We're getting eight inches of snow, eight inches. And then we got around five inches, and that's why I think every meteorologist should be a woman. Because if a woman tells you you're getting eight inches, God damn it, you are getting eight inches. Yes, only a man will tell you you're getting eight inches when he means around five. It's a very male thing to do. So I'm on the phone with David, and I say, are you angry because I'm being sexist toward men? I'm, I'm playing with their insecurities? And he said, no, you're, you're telling women what kind of jobs they can have. We, that's sexist. We can't have that. I don't think David got the joke. <laughs> so I got fired. And you might be wondering why I'm asking you tonight not to be David when it was Karen that called and complained. When she was a, here's why. Karen's going to Karen. You cannot change her. Her life existence is to wander around going, I don't like that. I, I feel the need to complain. I, I don't like that at all. No, no, no. But David was in a position of power. David had the opportunity to put Karen in her place. When she called, what he should have done is gone, David, human resources. Oh, Karen, what, what are you upset about now? Oh, the comedian tells jokes you don't like. Well... <laughs> Hey, here's an idea. Don't go to the party. Yeah. We... See, we have a problem in America right now, and that's that we cater to the crybaby. If 299 people want to hear a comedy show, but one doesn't, we, the one gets her way. They say the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Maybe the squeaky wheel should shut the fuck up. <laughs> Now, I'm Gen X, and that means my entire life, I was told, no one cares what you think, shut up and deal with it. Yeah. So that is how I go through life. I don't complain about things, I just internalize them. Probably gonna give me cancer someday, but that's what I do. <laughs> For example, the Kardashians. I don't like the Kardashians, I think they're a bunch of vapid whores. Yeah. Not really a joke, it's just how I feel about them. <laughs> but I don't complain about them, I don't get on Twitter like, you shouldn't watch their show, you shouldn't buy their cosmetics. No, I ignore them. I ignore them, they ignore me. They're billionaires, I only have health insurance because of my wife. <laughs> We're the same. But that brings us to the second part of my favor. Be Billy. So don't be David, be Billy. Again, this starts with a corporate party. I got hired to perform at a lumber yard in Edgewood, Iowa. Again, yeah, well, they have one there. They said, we're gonna have some beers and we want some jokes. We'll take care of the beers, you take care of the jokes. I went, all right. 
show up a little early, start talking to employees, meet a few of them, glad handle. They finally say, hey, uh, get on stage there, funny boy, make with the yuck yuck. So I did. <laughs> but the first thing I said to them was, I don't think this is a real lumber yard. And they were taken aback. They're like, we, we got chainsaws and all sorts of cutting implements on the walls. What do you mean? This is a... And I continued, I explained. I said, well, I talked to a bunch of you knuckleheads before the show, and every hand I shook had four fingers and a thumb. <laughs> and if this were a real lumber yard, at least one of you, and before I could finish that sentence, they all started laughing and pointing. Started yelling, Billy! <laughs> Billy's talking about your dumb ass! <laughs> and so I look and I see in the audience a guy with his hand <laughs> held high. And Billy had an index finger, middle finger, pinky, and thumb, but Billy couldn't get married. <laughs> Billy got a little too close to the bandsaw one day, lopped off his ring finger. And I'm not gonna lie to you, for a second, for a split second, I became frightened. I went, oh shit, I'm getting fired again. <laughs> but then I noticed Billy was laughing. He wasn't a professional victim. The comedian said words I don't like, I have an injury, I need a safe space for my comedy, no. He was laughing. Yes, he had been injured, but he got over it. Now, I'm not saying he lopped off his finger and went, well, that's going to be funny one day. <laughs> but he didn't take my words as an attack. And that's what you can do, not just tonight, when I tell a joke you don't like, and I know my act, I'm going to hit something you don't like. <laughs> but even in your day-to-day -day life, you have a choice. You can walk around like a Karen, I don't like anything. Mm -hmm. You can be like me, dead inside, probably not the healthiest. <laughs> or you can be like Billy and laugh it off. You have the choice to decide how you respond to stimulus you don't like. And so, one, what, no, don't, don't band it. <laughs> if it's organic, go with it. But just because one person claps, don't feel like, well, someone clapping, we should clap, no. So that night, I am looking at Billy, Billy's looking at me, and I asked him, I asked, Billy, do you have a girlfriend? And he said, no. And I said, well, you need to get one because you're carrying around a shocker at all times. That thing's like a loaded gun right there. And I had a fun show that night, and I hope we have a fun show tonight. And here's what's... Sure, here's what's funny about that story. Okay, don't talk over applause. I gotta tell myself that, don't talk over applause. Here's what's funny about that story, the whole thing. I actually do have a sexist joke on my YouTube page that probably should have gotten me fired. It goes like this. <laughs> Scientists have been studying the orgasm. Take that, anyone with an incurable disease like cancer or Parkinson's, not curing you, we're studying orgasms. Thanks, science. What they have determined is that when men finish, a single point on their brain lights up. When women complete, multiple points on their brain go off like fireworks, which goes to show you that even when having an orgasm, women tend to overthink shit. <laughs> Now, I should stop there because that's sexist and funny, but I'll, I'll dial it back a little. Um, guys, did you hear what I said? Women, multiple points of light? We don't, we don't do that. We, we have one. That's it. Um, women have fantastic orgasms. They can have multiples, and they can be full body, and they come in waves. It's amazing. What do men do? Bad Stallone impersonations. Adrian! In fact, ladies, a little secret for you. Uh, men are so jealous of your orgasms, that's why we pay you less on the dollar for your work. <laughs> and I made it sexist again. So that is the only time I've ever been fired uh, before a gig. I have had one experience where I was fired during a gig. I was on stage telling jokes. Someone walked right up next to me and went, you're done. 
It was at a college, I'm not gonna say which one, only because we're recording. Uh, usually I uh, throw them under the bus, but not tonight, because I'm not a lawyer. I don't know what the uh, ramifications would be. <laughs> Either way, I, I was talking to a bunch of disinterested students, and like I said, someone came on stage and said, uh, you're, you're done with your set. And I went, all right, I guess I'm getting fired. Got off stage and asked, what did I do wrong? Why, why did you pull me from the stage? And they said, you made a joke about gay marriage. So I countered and said, well, actually, I made a joke about marriage equality, politically correct, at the expense of bigots. And I was told, no, you are a straight white male. You do not get to talk about gay issues at all. And that's when I knew I was dealing with the stupidest person on the planet. Because one, I'm a comedian. I can talk about whatever the fuck I want to. And two, if I am a straight person and we have all the power, then I'm supposed to be what's called an ally to the gay community and champion their cause. And I do that through humor. And this is the joke that got me fired that night. And that will be the last time I use that phrase. I don't have a series of acts where I'm like, and then I got fired from here, and then I got fired from here, then I got, no, twice. Uh, here's the joke that got me fired. I was farting around online and I saw a clickbait headline that said, 10 threats to the American way of life. Well, I had to look at that, right? I have to know what to be afraid of. So I clicked it. Number one threat, gay marriage. Number two threat, terrorism. <laughs> That's the order they stacked those, butt sex above the boom boom. <laughs> that means there are people out there who get on an airplane and are more afraid of the two men holding hands than they are of the bearded fella trying to light the fuse on his Air Jordans. <laughs> that does not make sense to me. That does not compute. As a straight man, I would rather be on an airplane right next to two gay men having gay sex <laughs> than to be on any airplane with a bomb because I would rather get off that airplane sticky yet alive <laughs> over raining down from the sky in pieces. <laughs> now, that story has two happy endings, pun intended. <laughs> Number one, I still got paid for the gig, so ha ha. Less work, same pay, gotta like that. But then, number two, I eventually posted that joke online, and it was my first joke to ever go viral. The gay community embraced it, they got it. Which should tell you, don't be offended on behalf of other people. If you get offended by something, great. But don't sit there and go, well, I'm not sure if that's offensive or not, so I'm, I'm gonna be offended on behalf of other people just in case. No, don't hedge your bets, just laugh at what you find funny. And the first part I said where I can joke about anything, I can't speak for the gay community, but the gay community is not a monolith. They are individual people. Some have a sense of humor, some do not. Some are angry, some are happy. But if they are people, that means I can joke about them, which means I can tell this joke. <laughs> and this joke begins exactly the same way as the previous one. I was farting around online. <laughs> and I saw two lesbians on GoFundMe trying to raise $16,000 so that one of them could get impregnated. They wanted to start their family. I have a problem with this. Not a moral problem, start your family, ladies. I have a financial problem with this. $16,000? You're both women, you both have the baby making parts. You need $16. <laughs> yes, you take $16, you buy a 12er of old Milwaukee, knock a few back, play around a rock, paper, scissors, loser goes to the bar, jumps on the grenade. I know you won't like it. I know that's not what you're into, but marriage involves sacrifice. <laughs> and there is no I in team. I posted that joke online. A magnificent bastard named Jeremiah commented. He said, lesbians don't use rock, paper, scissors to settle disputes because they both pick scissors all night. <laughs> Not too much applause there, I didn't write that one.
That was all Jeremiah. What the lesbians should have done, in my opinion, if they wanted a baby, is gone to Walmart. Should have gone to Walmart. Do you not see the news? There was a couple in California, they got arrested in the parking lot of a Walmart for trying to sell their baby for $25. You groan, I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard of. Selling a baby in the parking lot of a Walmart? No one's buying. Anybody walking into that store has enough sunburn, snot those little window lickers kicking at their heels already. That, they're not picking up a third, fourth, fifth, or sixth. No, they're done. And $25? You think anybody shopping at Walmart has that kind of scratch? I hope you take Wick. Look, some of you groaned when I said people were selling a baby. Eh, I get it, but sometimes baby are co babies are colicky. They, they poop a lot. Maybe it's messy. You don't like it. You want to get rid of it. Don't take it to Walmart. Go to Pottery Barn. Yeah, any woman shopping there is going to be 40 and infertile, and she'll give you a hundy for your baby. So... Got to go to a wedding a couple months ago. That was exciting. My buddy Jake got married. I got to be a groomsman at his wedding. I had to buy a shirt and tie to stand in his wedding. I was buying the shirt and tie when the clerk looked at me and said, ooh, dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Which was odd because she was dressed for the body she wanted, not the one she had. Yeah. She was a very petite woman wearing very baggy clothes. Oh, did some of you turn that into a fat-shaming joke? <laughs> you did that in your own little noggins, didn't you? Yeah, that's the power of suggestion. I put words into the ether. You made it bad. I didn't. I do not fat-shame. No, no, no. I fat-embrace. You don't even need boobies to motor about a big girl. You can get thigh action. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I may have fat shamed once. Um, you can be the judge and jury on this. I'll tell you the story. I don't think I fat shamed, but I, I got called out. We'll see. Uh, my buddy Andy, my buddy Andy posted on Facebook. He wrote, ugh, the elevator was out at work today. I almost had a heart attack taking the stairs. So I commented, that's because you're fat. I didn't add any judgment. I didn't say fat and gross or fat and... I just, you know, you can't take stairs because he unfriended me. Yeah. He unfri and this is a friend of mine. This is, not, this is not a Facebook friend. This is someone I've broken bread with. So I texted him. I'm like, dude, did you really unfriend me over that? He texted right back, said, no, no, dude, we're cool. You just pissed my wife off by calling me fat. Yeah. So I apologized. That's what you do. I manned up, I apologized, I texted him right back. Oh my God, I am so sorry. Did she not know? <laughs> he called me an asshole, I called him bitch tits. We're friends. That's how we do it. Not a fan of Facebook. I, I spend a lot of time in Facebook jail, usually for something I posted five years ago, so that's exciting. I do like Facebook as sort of a soap opera. I like watching things on Facebook, uh, events unfolding. I have friends that overshare. Like, anything happens in their life, they put it online. Anything they think goes online. I have one friend. She shares everything, and one day she posted, that's it, wedding is off, I dumped my fiancé. So I held down the like button until I got the emojis, and I went over and tapped sad face. I showed empathy. I'm a good person. <laughs> Then a couple days later, she posted, okay, wedding's back on, it was just a fight. I thought that was kind of stupid, so a couple months later, when she posted that her mom died, I was not falling for that shit a second time. <laughs> Ooh, I have a buddy going through a divorce on Facebook. My buddy Jake just got married. I have a buddy going through a divorce. Have any of you ever experienced that? It's fun. Yeah, it's exciting watching, because they post all their pain and anger, and you just sit back and laugh because you're a bad person. Um, just me? No? I, I, I thought it was hilarious, and my friend is finally getting better or healing, whatever you want to call it. I guess he's in therapy, but he's been posting 
motivational quotes. He dropped this little rainbow the other day. Let me share it with you. Every day, a flower unfurls to face the sun. Today, you can be that flower. I commented, Jesus Christ, dude, did your wife leave because your vagina's bigger than hers? <laughs> he unfriended me too. I kind of understand that one though. I'm gonna let that one slide. Have an idea in my head. I think I'm gonna become a documentary filmmaker. I have a new idea. I want to maybe enter it in Sundance, maybe get an Oscar, maybe get myself an Oscar, who knows. Um, what I'm going to do to make my movie is I'm going to buy a GoPro, and then I'm going to put it on my dashboard in my car, and then I'm just going to drive like I normally drive. And when I end up behind someone who comes to a complete stop before entering an empty roundabout, or who gets into an empty roundabout and then stops and waves someone else in in front of them, or who gets into an empty roundabout and just stops to make sure no one's coming, well, then I'm gonna follow them. I'm gonna follow that person, and when they stop their car and get out, I'm gonna stop and like wave, and I'm like, hey, hi, how are you doing? Can I talk to you for a second? I wanna ask you a couple of questions, and we're gonna talk about their driving habits, and that's gonna be my movie. It will be a documentary, and I'm gonna call it, the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> Because I'm curious. I, I want to know. Have kids. Uh, I'm trying to raise my kids to be accepting and inclusive of all people. I am. And we had a teachable moment recently. We had a teachable moment. I took them to Target. And we got to the parking lot, parked the car, and before I could even open my door, I accidentally locked eyes with the woman one car over who was blowing into her, whoops, I've had too many DUIs to, to start her car. Yeah. And she was embarrassed. You could see the look on her face. She's like, she would rather have been caught blowing a dude in the parking lot. <laughs> and so again, teachable moment with my kids. I'm looking at her, they're feeling out. We're like, why does that lady look weird? I want to teach them to be accepting and inclusive of all people. We do not judge anyone by their worst moment. We accept them. So what I did is I maintained eye contact. I reached down between the seats. I picked up my beer and I toasted to her health. <laughs> We've all been there, ma'am. First time I ever told that story on stage was in Kansas City, Missouri. Someone yelled out from the audience, You shouldn't have beer in your car if you have kids in your car. Like, maybe I have beer in my car because I have kids in my car. I am trying to teach my kids to be accepting and inclusive of all people, and that is how we ended up with a book on our bookshelf at home, free, signed by the author of said book, just sent to us for free. It's called I Am Jazz. And my kids are nine and 11. This story begins five, six years ago. Let's just say they were five and three at the time. And I take my kids to the library once a week, maybe once every two weeks. You've probably heard the expression, do not judge a book by its cover. That's not how kids operate. They don't go into the library and read the back jacket. Well, a bug picnic, that sounds interesting. They see a picture. It's kind of like how a drunk orders breakfast at Denny's at 2 a.m. <laughs> yeah, they're going like, a, I want moons over my hip. I want moons over my hip. Pancakes. They just... <laughs> And so my daughter, I take her, she's the five-year-old at the time, uh, she sees a book called I Am Jazz. It's got a little girl dressed as a mermaid on it. And she goes, mermaid girl, I want to read that. And I don't know anything about the book. We go home. It's nighttime. Uh, got him on the couch. Got the boy on one side. Got the daughter on the other side. And a little side note, children's books by and large suck. They're simple sentences. They, they put you asleep faster than they put the kids to sleep. You're just, they're boring and stupid. And I'm going to admit, I went into this book with a bad attitude. I am telling you that up front. So, start reading the book. My name is Jazz. Mmm, got that from the cover. Turn the page. I like dressing up like a mermaid. 
also got that from the cover. Ooh, turn the page. I like having dance parties with my friends Cassidy and Samantha. <sighs> Turn the page. But I'm not like Cassidy and Samantha. Huh. <laughs> Turn the page. I'm a little girl that was born a boy. That's called being transgender. Oh. <laughs> Holy shit! I didn't see that coming! That's a better twist than any M. Night Shyamalama Ding Dong movie right there. That took me by surprise. Bruce Willis is dead. I figured that out over an hour ago. Village is present time. I got that in 30 seconds. Lady in the Water sucks. I figured that out from the commercial. This, this was a twist right here. And so what happened was I wrote this blog about a book that tells kids about transgender people and it went viral because I said this is a really neat book and the author saw the blog, contacted me and said, would you like a signed copy of the book? I said, fuck yeah, it's a kid's author. So I said, heck yeah. And, and so she sent us this book. Now, the reason I gave you that backstory and told you about an event from years ago is because Several months ago, in Texas, a first grade teacher read I Am Jazz to her students, and parents lost their collective minds. Oh my God, how dare you read a book about transgender people to kids? What if kids decide to become transgender? And when I heard that, I started get, getting a headache behind my eye because that's, that's not how it works. You, you don't read a book and then become that thing. If that's how it worked, then evangelicals would be kind, caring, and compassionate people. <laughs> don't be David. <laughs> when I read the book to my kids, that was it. When the book ended, my daughter said, wait, so it's a girl that was born a boy? And I went, yeah, pretty much. And she goes, that's weird. I'm like, yeah, it must be weird to be in the wrong body. And that was it. That was our whole conversation. She didn't run into the kitchen, grab a banana and say, I'm a boy now. Daddy, show me how to windmill like you do for mommy. Some of you might call it the helicopter. I don't know, it, you know. My son did not do a Buffalo Bill tuck and say, Alexa, play goodbye horses. It's a funny reference if you get it. That was it. And let me, let me, let me do a quick aside here, very quickly. Um, when I do that joke in deep red conservative places, do you know what happens? They laugh at all the right places. They don't care. See, there's the difference between in-person and online. I'm filming this. If I take that clip and put it out there, you know it's going to start a fight. Oh, anti-religion comedian, and then people will defend me. That happens online. We're all the same. We might vote for different people, but when I go into deep red conservative counties, they laugh just like you laugh. They don't, and they even applaud, like, yeah, hey, that's us. We get it. Yeah, I don't have a joke there. I'm just letting you know that. We're not that different. And I will say this. Uh, um, I understand that I influence my kids. That's my job, to raise them correctly. And I know that they're paying attention to me, you know, when I have a reaction. Like, if I turn the page, transgender, ew, then they're like, oh, okay, you. That's how we think of transgender people. I know that, that they're paying attention to me. What I did not know is that they are paying attention to me 24-7 even when I think they are not looking, and I learned that the hard way when my daughter got invited to a birthday party at a llama farm. I took her to the llama farm, and when we got there, the llama handler said, all right, everybody, safety meeting, gather around. <laughs> okay, what you gotta remember is, llamas is temperamental. If they don't like you, they spit. And without skipping a beat, my daughter said, yeah, but if they love you, they swallow. Oh. And every parent turned to look at me. I'm like, hi, I'm the comedian dad. I, 
I must have said something when I thought she wasn't paying attention. I was probably talking to her mom, trying to... Uh, uh, yeah, they're always paying attention. And I'll, I'll share this with you. It, it's, it's odd. Um, I, this is cliche. It's not odd, it's cliche. And I apologize for what I'm about to say, but I learn as much from my kids as I teach them. I know, eh, it's kind of cheesy, but stay with me. I have learned more about the act of forgiveness from my daughter than I ever thought I would know. Again, we're going back in time. She's probably six years old. Her best friend is the neighbor girl, Everly. And in summer, they play together all day, every day. And when you're that young and you're with someone all day, you start to butt heads. Well, one day, my daughter comes into the house crying, just sobbing, and I react. Oh my God, sweetie, are you okay? And she says, I'm never playing with Everly again. She's so mean, I hate her. And I went, all right, kid drama, whatever. And my daughter goes into her room, closes the door. Five minutes later, she came out and went, okay, I'm gonna go play with Everly now. <laughs> Five minutes, that's all it took her to get over hate, never again, so mean. I know she didn't get that from her mom. <laughs> no, my wife is still upset with me because I didn't respond to a text from her quickly enough in 2012. <laughs> My water broke, where are you? <laughs> Busy. <laughs> Doing stuff. My daughter was a bad sleeper uh, when she was a baby. We'd try and uh, set her down to go to bed or take a nap and she would just fuss. So my wife, she looked up infant massage and it worked great. We'd rub her little tootsies, rub her shoulders and she'd just <laughs> drop. Problem is, we created a monster. She is 11 years old, she still wants back rubs before bed, and I am more than happy to give them to her because I am a man, and I was once a teenage boy, and I know all the teenage boys' tricks, especially, hey, would you like a back rub? Yeah, so some kid's gonna try that on my daughter, he's gonna get up in there, start rubbing her, and she's gonna say, oh, that's just how my dad does it. And that right there is a boner killer. <laughs> Unless they're in Arkansas, but otherwise. <laughs> but okay, say, it's, say it doesn't kill his boner. Say he's like, well, that's weird, but he keeps going. My daughter is not in the right frame of mind. So if he tries a little like over the shoulder action, she's, ew, ew, gross, what are you doing? <laughs> Those kids are playing checkers. I'm playing 4D chess. Hands off my daughter, pricks. <laughs> I'm not bragging right here, I'm not. I said my kids are 11 and nine, they're potty trained. Got them housebroken, that's awesome. Yeah, you'd think they're potty trained at this age. But when my daughter was just a little baby, when my daughter was just a little tiny baby, she was a trickster. She was a trickster she was. My daughter had the ability to poop out the front of her diaper, up the front of her body, and she could ding the base of her chin with her own poop. Groans, nothing? You can, sir, can you do that? Can you, can you ding your own? I can't, I've tried. I'm a grown man. I've tried to get my poop up here. I can't do it. So uh, when I walked in on my daughter, I'm like, I don't know how you did that, but I am impressed. I was so confused. I asked about it when we took her in for the next service check. <laughs> yeah, you gotta take them in once a year for maintenance, right? Make sure they're properly inflated. Yeah, he looked her over, gave a thumbs up and asked, do you have any questions? I said, I got one. Uh, I know her poop comes out back here. Can you explain how it ends up here? And he did. He said, well, uh, diapers are usually very small. They have a very a limited space to hold fecal matter. So when she has a big boom boom there, the smooth surface up front, her, her, her baby lady, let's call it, the baby lady, that acts as sort of a conduit, an irrigation ditch, if you will, that allows the poop to flow. And I said, Doc, I'm gonna stop you right there. What you are saying makes me happier than ever I was born a boy, because what you are saying is that technically, balls are nature's mud flap. <laughs> yeah. 
bought that shit. <laughs> and that was my favorite joke. For two years, I loved telling that joke. Then my son was born. Guess what? Balls are nature's mud flap. It sent his shit straight up his back. <laughs> There's no escaping it. It just goes somewhere different. <laughs> my son is potty trained as well. My wife uh, handled that like a champion. I, I tried my hand at potty training our kids or at my son. That did not work out well because I would just let him play and every so often I'd go, buddy, is your poop waking up? And he'd say, no, my poop is sleeping. And I'd say, all right, good on you. Five minutes later, buddy, is your poop waking up? And he'd say, my poop woke up. I need changed. I'm like, what the fuck? We just five minutes, like... <laughs> So since that wasn't working, my wife took over and she instituted potty sitting sessions where he, every hour on the hour, had to go into the bathroom and sit on the toilet and he could not go play until he put something into said toilet. Doing that on command is difficult. And so I would be on the road performing comedy and I would get texts from my wife like this one. Most of today, every time we'd have a potty sitting session, he'd start playing with his junk until it was hard, and then he'd hide it in his shirt tail saying, Mommy, my penis is hiding in my shirt. <laughs> so then I would try to block him from playing with it because you can't pee with a boner, parentheses, or so I've heard. <laughs> that's true. That, that's true. And then I found myself shouting, note the all caps up front, do you see that, all caps? Do not play with your penis, when it's hard, you can't pee, oh my God, fuck my life. <laughs> now, the reason I gave you the physical representation of potty training by sitting on the toilet is because from age three until six, that is not how our son went to the bathroom. No, no. What he would do is he would go into the bathroom, he would climb onto the toilet, facing the back of the toilet, facing the wall, and squat down like this. He was like a catcher in baseball. Am I going number one, number two? What am I doing up here? Number <laughs> two. And I know this because for years, he left the door open. He liked to share with the world what was going on in there. And one day, I walked by the open door and saw my son in the bathroom, on the toilet, facing the wall, just looking around. <laughs> and so I paused and watched him for maybe 15, 20 seconds, which doesn't sound like a long time, but when you are watching your son just looking around the bathroom, it's an eternity. So finally, I asked, Buddy, what are you doing? And he answered, nothing. So I asked, do you have to poop? And he said, no. So I asked, do you have to pee? And he responded, I already did. <laughs> so that brought us back to question number one. <laughs> what are you doing? And my son whispered, he whispered, there's no toilet paper. <laughs> He likes to wipe his wiener after a good pee. <laughs> right? We've all been there, right, fella? You think you're done, you pull the underpants up, but nope, there's a couple drops left. He didn't want to walk squishy, so he was looking for toilet paper. I leaned in, saw there was no toilet paper, said, all right, buddy, there's always a spare roll in the drawer right here. I opened the drawer, I took out the toilet paper, I tore off one square, I handed it to my son. He dabbed his dingling, wiped his mouth, and dropped it in the toilet. So I said the only thing I could think to say at a moment like that, which was, good job, buddy, why don't you, um, go give mommy a kiss. Let her know that you love her. Like that one? Uh, 
I worry about my kids, I do. I worry about the world they're going to grow up in. And by that, I mean, I can only control how my children are raised while they're under my roof. When they're off in the wild, I have no say in what happens. And I have certain ideas in my head how I want my kids to be, but society changes and that can skew your parenting ideas. Case in point, um, we all make fun of millennials right now. They're sort of the punching bag generation. We call them the, the participation trophy generation. We call them snowflakes. What we tend to forget is millennials didn't raise themselves. Somebody gave them the participation trophies. I didn't win. Uh, yes, you did. Here you go. And now we're angry at them for being demanding and fragile? I don't think so. But I do know what happened. I know what happened to millennials, and I'm worried about my kids. Playgrounds changed from my childhood to my adulthood. In the early 1990s, playgrounds changed. When I was a kid, playgrounds were paved over, made of concrete. And when you fell down, you got hurt. But you learned a life lesson. You learned caution and respect for the world around you. I was six years old. I went to a concrete playground. I got on some swings. I started going back and forth and back and forth. What did I do when I got to the top of the arc? I jumped. And as soon as I was in the air, I went, that was a bad idea. I landed, I busted up my leg, I limped home crying, but back then, parenting meant my dad took one look at me and started laughing. <laughs> What'd you learn? That's what he asked. I'm a child, I'm crying, I'd like a hug, I'd like a ride in an ambulance. Wee, wee, wee. Instead, I'm getting, what'd you learn? I'm like, well, I'm learning, you're a dick. <laughs> But then I realized, oh wait, I'm not jumping off the swings again. Pain taught me a lesson. But in the early 1990s, a kid fell down on a playground, went home crying. The parent didn't ask, did you learn a lesson? The parent went, oh my sweet little angel, you hurt yourself. It's not your fault, it's not my fault. Heaven forbid parental responsibility. I'm gonna sue. I'm gonna sue the city, the county, the state. I'm gonna make them make playgrounds out of Nerf. That way when kids fall down, they bounce back just like Bumbles, Bumbles bounce. And that's how we raised a generation of Nancy Pantses. <laughs> and I didn't know that until I became a dad. I did not know playgrounds had changed because I hadn't been to one in 20 years because I'm not a pedophile. <laughs> I don't even own a trench coat. But we had a daughter, and I don't know how old she was, two, and we took her to a playground, and she toddled around. And I turned to my wife, and I'm looking, and I say, where's the merry-go-round? And my wife said, well, it's gone. And I said, well, I can see that, but why? She goes, it wasn't safe. I said, I know, that's what made it fun. That was, <laughs> that was the point. The merry-go-round was you would get on and hold on with everything you had, <laughs> And your friend would try and whip you off. If you held on, you won. If you got hurt, he won. That was the game. And my wife sniffed. And then I said, all right, fine. And my daughter, she toddled around and she went and she got on a spring-loaded board that had two seats. She sat down on one side and went boingy, boingy, boingy. And I said, well, that looks lame. And my wife explained, well, they made the teeter-totter safe. They knew and improved it. And I said, oh, hell no. That, that's not a teeter-totter. The teeter-totter would go up and down and up and down. And when you were on top, your friend would look at you. <laughs> smile, a wicked smile. Yell, cherry bomb, jump off. You fell to the ground, busted your butt, and it hurt, but you learned not to trust people. <laughs> that is an important lesson to learn in life, not to trust people. And if you take that away from kids, they will not get the same life lessons I got growing up. Lessons about observation and absorption, human interaction where you understand. If you pick up a hitchhiker, you end up in the trunk of your own car. <laughs> or if you're 16 and experimenting and play a round of, okay, just the tip, you still end up pregnant. <laughs>
Now, I do know who to blame for this uh, protecting of kids, overprotecting, making them safe. Moms, you need to dial it back. And I know it's moms because my wife went from a, a, a rational, sane woman, and then she became a mom, and suddenly it was all about the baby. All about the baby. Moms and dads are different. Moms are like, I will always take care of you. I will protect you. You were a part of me. Dads are like, ah, if you wander into traffic and get killed, shit, we'll make another. <laughs> and I can prove your mom protected you. I can, using your childhood. Think back to your childhood right now. Pick a nice spring day, not too hot, not too humid, sky is blue, and you are driving in a car with your mom. Got your favorite song on the radio, you're bouncing in the seat, everything's good. Suddenly, she had to slam on the brakes. What happened at the exact same time? You just did it, you just, yes. She's right back there, did it? She shot out the mom arm. Yep, she caught you because she cared. Nothing was gonna happen to you. Her foot went for the break, her arm went for you. In fact, you got hurt more by her catch than the stop. She clotheslined you. <laughs> Thank you, mommy. May I have a new larynx for my birthday? But it was a fluid motion, she caught you. Now, put your dad behind the wheel of that car. There was no such thing as a dad arm. In fact, not only would your dad not catch you if he had to slam on the brakes, your dad would slam on the brakes on purpose to settle your ass down. <laughs> you would be in the back seat jumping around, Daddy, there's a puppy. Can we get a puppy? That guy's walking a puppy. Daddy, there's McDonald's. I want to get a Happy Meal. Can we get a Happy Meal? Your dad was like, oh, bullshit. Slam on the brakes. You went ass over tea kettle, bounced your head off the dash. Oh, that hurt. <laughs> What'd you learn? Well, you're a dick. <laughs> You didn't. You did not jump around in the car again. I worry about my kids becoming teenagers because I just saw, I should, well, I just saw a statistic and I am very worried. The statistic I just saw said that teenagers today, teenagers right now, they are doing fewer drugs than previous generations of teenagers. They are drinking less than previous generations and they are having less sex than previous generations. But don't worry, they are also more depressed. <laughs> Were you paying attention there? Less drugs, less drinking, less sex, but more depressed. I don't want to get all get off my lawn old man grumpy here, but I'm a little pissed because pot is becoming more and more legal as time goes by, and kids aren't smoking it. They have easier access to it than when I was a kid. When I was a teenager, I had to walk five miles uphill both ways in a snowstorm to meet a dealer who would sell me stems. Now they give you a menu. The fuck, teenagers? Order up, and the menu has choices. We, we would sit in the car going, I think I'm stoned, do you think you're stoned? I think I'm stoned. Now it's like they ask, do you, do you want a giggly stone? Do you, want, do you want a relaxing high? Do you want a sort of trippy high? Teenagers, take advantage of this. And okay, maybe you live in a state where pot is not legal. You still have grandparents, right? Visit them. Visit your grandparents for two reasons. One, they're gonna be happy. Oh, Billy came to visit me, that's so nice. But two, you get to root around in their medicine cabinet. You are gonna find a bottle of pills that says do not take with alcohol. I'm here to tell you, take one of those pills with alcohol. I don't know exactly what it's gonna do, but it is gonna loosen you up. You're gonna lose some of that teen anxiety. You're gonna get yourself out there. You're gonna get yourself laid. You're gonna get yourself happy. You're welcome. Love, Gen X. One more message for the kids, one more message for teenagers. If you had asked uh, kids 15 years ago what they want to be, they would have said doctor, athlete, scientist, president. You ask them today, they all say the same thing. Influencer, YouTuber. <laughs> I stand before you as an influencer. I have over 260,000 subscribers. My YouTube page just hit 100 million views Woo! last month. 
Last month, I got paid $138 USA, USA, USA. Kids, stay in school, learn a trade, or, or be a five-year-old that unwraps presents because apparently you can make six figures doing that shit. All right, my wife has escaped being made fun of thus far. Let's change that, shall we? I don't know how many people know this, not uh, many, especially anybody watching the video that doesn't know me, but um, I moved to the Midwest to be with my wife. I was living in Los Angeles when we met. We had a long distance relationship. She stalked me on MySpace, that's how we met. And um, we've been together a few years. Yeah, we're, we're getting up there in our years. Um, when it came time to move, I wanted to move back here because I fell in love with a Midwest girl because I did not like Los Angeles women. I didn't. They have an attitude. Here, I'll give you an example. You pay a compliment to a woman in Los Angeles, they get snotty. You say, hey, I really like that purse. And they say, thanks. It's Versace, costs a thousand dollars. Pay that compliment to any single woman in the room right now. Hey, I really like your purse. Oh my goodness, $20 TJ Maxx. <laughs> Does your wife need a purse? Let's go get one for her. I like picking out purses. I like that enthusiasm, I do. And uh, I'll tell you this, um, my wife and I, we just got new neighbors, that's exciting stuff. The very first thing we learned about our neighbors is we can hear them. <laughs> doors closed, windows closed, their doors, our windows, everything closed, we can hear them. And if you're not on the same page, catch up. I'm not explaining it further than that. You should catch the inference. Um, my wife and I reacted to this information differently. My wife said, oh my goodness, how do we tell them about this in a way that is sensitive to their emotional needs and doesn't embarrass them? And I responded by saying, challenge accepted. <laughs> Sweetie, get in the bedroom. Let's show them what we're made of. I said my wife and I have been together since MySpace. Um, here is what I discovered, that you can be with someone for years, even decades, and still learn new things about them. My wife was in the bathroom the other day, peeing her morning pee like you do, door closed, because we have a door closed policy at our house. It used to be door open, and then she tried pooping in front of me, and then, nope, that was it, door closed <laughs> policy. I don't know why women find that so casual. I'm just gonna poop with you standing there watching. No, you're not. No, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. So I could hear her. I could hear her peeing because she had some pretty impressive pressure going on. I sounded like she was chipping porcelain. She would have done a fireman proud. And then I heard her sneeze. Then there was a pause. And then she started laughing. And so when she exited the bathroom, I asked what was so funny in there, and she explained, well, as women get older, especially women who have given birth, they start to lose a little control downstairs, and sometimes when you sneeze, you tinkle just a little bit. So while I was in the bathroom peeing and I sneezed, I had the active thought, oh good, I'm, I, I'm peeing, so I didn't make a mess. Then I realized, oh, this is my life now. I'm happy about <laughs> peeing and sneezing on the toilet. And I started sad laughing, like, ah, this is my life. I, I sneeze, pee on the toilet, and it makes me happy. It is so bad, but it helps me because now I learned something new. So now if I hear my wife sneeze in the house, I can yell, hey, do you need to change your britches? <laughs> It can help me be a sensitive husband to her needs. <laughs> I married the right woman, I did. I know I did because my wife is devious. Um, when, my, when our kids were younger, when they were just little tiny ones and we wanted to um, play, we would put them in front of the TV and then steal away to the bedroom. But the last thing my wife would say is, don't come into the bedroom, I'm gonna read daddy the dictionary. She said that every single time, and, and I, it struck me as funny, but I never thought about it until maybe the 10th time she had said it, and I asked, I said, why do you say that? And she said, well, 
as they get older, they're going to start figuring out what married couples do. And I don't know when it's going to happen, but someday they're going to have a realization. Wait a second. Read the diction. Ew! My wife is playing the long game, and God bless her for it. She is fucking with our kids' heads, and they don't even know it. Start winding down, I'll tell you this about my wife. Um, everybody that I know says their wife is their better half, and oh, you know, my wife is the beautiful one. They wonder how I caught her. My wife really is my better half, and I have proof now. You can always pretend it, you can always say it, but unless you have something to back it up, it means nothing. I have something to back it up. This past spring, several months ago, my wife, who I did not know until we were adults, she grew up in Iowa. I grew up next door in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we, yeah, we did not live in the same town. We didn't go to the same school, nothing. We met as adults. This past spring, my wife got invited to my high school reunion, and I did not. <laughs> they contacted her and said, Nathan's probably not. We'd love to see you. And that, to me, is the funniest thing that has ever happened in my life. I, I know it's not a great story or joke. I loved it. But I actually did figure it out. It took me a while. Like, wait a second. This, this is funny. But why would they? And then I realized my buddy from high school is on the reunion planning committee. And I kind of embarrassed him recently. He told me something in a drunken confession. He said, hey, I got to ask you a question. Don't tell anyone. Yeah. I won't tell anyone. I never stand on a stage in front of people with lights and a microphone. Who would I tell? What he did is he asked me, he said, hey, I, I, are, are you okay downstairs? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I, I, I've been taking Viagra. I'm like, okay, so? He's like, well, it's embarrassing. My wife doesn't know. Like, Embarrassing. You, th you think taking Viagra is embarrassing. You're getting older, your body's changing, and you can correct that with a pill. That's embarrassing. Motherfucker, your favorite band is Imagine Dragons. Be embarrassed by that. It's on your Facebook profile about me, public for the world to see. You are a grown-ass man. You are not a 12-year-old girl trying to fit in with other tin-eared preteens. Thunder's a really good song. Please don't exclude me. I like what you like. Oh, my goodness. Who cares if you're taking Viagra? I'm not there yet, but I will be someday. And you're not going down without a fight. God damn it, neither will I. I'm going down like the musicians on the Titanic. I am playing till the end. I will take pills. I will use popsicle sticks and scotch tape. I will not go gentle into that good night. I will rage against the dying of the light. And speaking of rage, change your favorite band to Rage Against the Machine. God damn it, you're an adult. Act like one. Let us put a cherry on this comedy Sunday. Let us put a bow on this comedy package I have given you. I want to end tonight's show by talking about gratitude. And this story begins many, many years ago when I was a young pup in comedy. And I was given the opportunity to open for a comedian who was about to become famous. You would not have heard of him at the time, but on the comedy circuit, we all knew, like, oh, he, he's got the heat. He, he's going to be the next big thing. He doesn't have to reach out and grab the golden ring. Hollywood is going to pluck him like the claw from Toy Story. The claw! They just take him and make him. And so I was excited. I was excited. I have this opportunity. I went to the comedy club. It was in a small town in central Illinois. And I went into the green room. And there was this soon-to-be-famous comic, and I'm a little nervous, and I stuck my hand out and said, Hi, I'm Nathan. I'm your opening act. I can't read minds, but I can read faces and body language. And what he did was he looked at me, looked at my hand, sort of had a who-the-fuck-are-you expression on his face, and then turned away and sort of left me hanging. And I felt kind of stupid and backed out of the green room and left. 
not the comedy club, just the green room, and that was our only interaction of the entire weekend. I would get on stage, tell my jokes, he would get on stage and complain about how his wife and daughter were a pain in his ass and he hated them. And then after that weekend, it all came true. I mean, he, he got a TV show, it got canceled, he got another one, he started winning the Emmys, he was a critic's darling, the funniest comedian in the world. He was hosting Saturday Night Live. And I'm not proud of this, but every single time I would see him, I would, I would see just a little. I'd see his picture, I'd watch his success as I struggled to get booked and, and, and get into rooms, and he was just taking off, and I'd be like, I'd, I'd get angry. Not proud of it, but that's what would happen. Then the Me Too movement hit. And icons started falling. Assholes like Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein and female comedians started speaking out about this guy, saying that when they opened for him, he would say, hey, you want to hang out? And they would say, wow, you're famous. Yeah, maybe you can help my career. I'll hang out with you. And they would sit down and hang out, maybe in a green room. Maybe they'd hang out and they'd ask him back to his hotel. And he'd say, all right, um, you want to watch me masturbate? And he'd whip his penis out and he'd start jerking off in front of him. And if that wasn't bad enough, the following Monday, his manager would call them and say, if you tell anyone, I will destroy your career. Okay, first of all, um, quick aside, that kind of explains my weekend with him, and it makes me feel a little better about it. Like, <laughs> if, if his fetish is cheating on his wife by jerking off in front of female comics, and I walk in, hey, I'm the opener, I'm Nathan, he's like, ah, oh, fuck! You know, I've ruined his weekend, that's on me, I'm sorry. Yeah. But... Like before, I wasn't proud of this, but he lost everything. Hollywood canceled all his shows. He, he had a movie that was supposed to come out. He got taken out of that. And I sort of went, you know, a little Nelson Muntz. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I celebrated his failure. Not proud of it. Okay, that's the backstory. Here's the, here's the end. Uh, about a year ago, I was in St. Paul, Minnesota, playing a very small comedy club. Only held 70 people. And the Friday show went great. I was all excited for Saturday. Go walking in. Saturday is pretty much sold out. I am in a good mood. I'm just looking around so happy. I am the headlining comic, and my opening act comes up to me and says, isn't this great? I say, yeah, this is amazing. And then he says, it is amazing that all these people came out to see you, a nobody that's not famous, went across town at the other comedy club. There is a famous comic getting paid tens of thousands of dollars. It's the club that won't work you because you've never been on TV. That's not what he said. That's what I heard. <laughs> he just said there's a famous comic at the other club. And I heard the rest. And of course, it was the guy from my past. He got canceled, but he was still selling out comedy clubs and making tens of thousands of dollars where I'd get a couple hundred dollars. And for a moment, for a split second, I just, I slid, I snapped, I started going back and I went, mm, that fucking guy. And then I caught myself. I actively had the thought, wait a second, wait a second. A moment ago, you were in a good mood. What changed? Nothing. I got information that didn't matter to me at all. I heard about something someone else was doing. And I realized, oh, I have a decision to make. I can be angry and bitter about what I don't have, or I can be grateful for what is right in front of me. And I... <laughs> and then I remembered my Hamlet. There is nothing that is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. There is nothing that is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. I had an audience there to see me. I have a wife that I love. I have kids that I love. I love my life. And I may have four fingers and a thumb, <laughs> but I can get my billy on like nobody's business. So that's what I decided to do. So thank you for coming out tonight and seeing a comic you've never heard of. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you. I hope you had fun. Have a good finish to your weekend. Have a good finish to your life if I don't see you again. Good night.